Okay, so today we have the uh, pleasure of having as our speaker Jack Dongera. Uh, two weeks ago to the day, uh, Jack received what is um, commonly known as the Nobel Prize of Computing. It's the ACM Turing Award, and it's one of ACM's most, it's the most prestigious technical award that ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery awards. Jack was honored for his powering pioneering concepts and methods which have resulted in world-changing computations. So um, congratulations to you, Jack, from all of us. Take it away. Okay, well, thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. I, I actually was informed about the Turing Award uh, from the Turing Committee uh, uh, around the 1st of March. And they told me under no circumstances could I tell anybody about this, uh, this award. And I says, well, what about my wife? And they asked, is she in computing? And I said, no. She said, okay, tell your wife, but you can't tell your kids. They were afraid it would get leaked out. And, you know, of course, I'm humbled and, and honored to be uh, receiving the award. Um, I, I have to give credit to uh, uh, the generation of colleagues and students and staff that uh, I've worked with over the years that made, uh, made this possible. And um, uh, it, it, it uh, you know, I've known some of the Turing Award uh, recipients. I've uh, written papers with them. Uh, and it's uh, great to be included in, in that uh, group. Uh, I only hope I can live up to, um, uh, to the reputations that, they, that they've had and, and uh, help in maybe educating the next generation of computer, uh, computer scientists. So uh, let, me, let me start to talk, otherwise we'll be on this for a long time. <laughs> so, okay, so not a simple matter of software. Uh, I'm at the University of Tennessee. I'm sitting in my office. Uh, at the university right now. I also have a position at Oak Ridge National Laboratory about 40 miles away. And I also work at the, in the maths department at the University of Manchester about, uh, what is it, 4,000 miles away. So I'm gonna be talking about some work and it's been mainly funded by um, the NSF in the SICE program and also in the DOE Exascale Computing Program. So those are, those are the main funders of uh, what I've been doing for a long time. So here's an outline. We're gonna look at some changes that have taken place in high performance computing. Look at the hardware and software evolution from the standpoint of linear algebra software. Look at some of the key features that we have on our hardware today, and then maybe some thoughts about the future. So I wanna turn the clock back to when I started in computing. So this is in the early seventies and these were the supercomputers. So the CDC 7600 and the IBM 37195. The 7600 was at Livermore and the 195 was at Argonne National Lab. You could see there the, the sort of characteristics of it, the clock cycle times around 36 megahertz and around 18 megahertz for the IBM system. You know, the primary memory is sort of striking. So the, the CDC had 64 kilowords of memory and those were 60 bit words. There was no IEEE standard at that time. Seymour Cray had a hand in designing that system and at a peak about 36 uh, megaflops. And the IBM system, again, had you know, modest amount of memory, four megabytes of memory on the IBM system. But both of these architectures were um, really advanced for their time. They were advanced in the sense they had a high degree of instruction level of pipelining and also parallelism uh, within the instructions, almost like a, today we refer to it as a, a VLIW uh, architecture, very long instruction word architecture. So they were able to uh, execute things uh, in just that way. So in the, uh, in the 70s, um, uh, there was a book, uh, Wilkinson Reinsch, of course, which, uh, which laid out a set of state-of-the-art algorithms for linear algebra. There was an effort at, um, at Argonne, along with uh, a number of other people, uh, to put together a Fortran from the ALGOL uh, algorithms. And that was called the NATS project. And the NATS project, um, I think it originally stood for NSF, Argonne, Texas, and Stanford, and then it later got changed to the National Activity for Testing Software. But it was basically an effort to uh, Fortranize uh, the wilkinson Reinsch uh, books. Uh, the, the algorithms in the handbook are uh, written in ALGOL, ALGOL is row-oriented, and uh, we faithfully translated the row orientation into Fortran. And uh, Fortran, unfortunately, doesn't have row orientation for its uh, arrays. They're column-based. And the result of that um, you know, led to some in, in, uh, uh, poor performance, I'll say, on architectures. The architectures at the time uh, were scalar architectures. So we had those uh, CDC and IBM machines uh, to contend with in terms of uh, the, the, the platforms. 
the, the software that was being developed really had a number of, uh, of attributes and they're listed at the top there. They wanted to have good accuracy. We wanted to get the community involved in the software. We wanted to have innovation, state-of-the-art methods. We wanted to have performance, uh, high performance. We wanted to get productivity and portability. We wanted to have the codes be readable and also reliable. So those are the attributes that uh, I think went into that software. And in fact, I think have gone into many of the software packages since then. In the 70s and late 70s and 80s, the architectures uh, changed. They, uh, they were no longer scalar. They moved to vector architectures. And, and these are two very uh, clear representations of the vector architectures that we had with us at that time. So the Cray architecture um, is, is on the left there. That's Seymour Cray. He was the designer of that. Uh, Seymour was also the designer of the uh, 7600 on the previous slide. And uh, he left CDC to form uh, this company called Cray and um, uh, built a machine based on vector, uh, vector instructions. CDC also had a vector uh, machine and that was called the Star 100. These machines were quite different in terms of their characteristics. Uh, the Cray had vector registers. So there were eight of these vector registers. Uh, each of those registers had 64 elements. You would fill up those 64 elements from memory and then perform operations on them from the register. The CDC star had a quite different way of organizing things. There were no vector registers. So you stream data from memory into the functional unit and then stream it back out into memory. And uh, the result of that led to uh, much slower performance, I'll say, uh, on, these, uh, on, these, um, uh, on, on these machines. So the Cray was getting uh, really quite impressive performance and the CDC uh, star 100 uh, was, I would say, inferior to uh, to the design of Cray. Uh, both of those machines were used by the Department of Energy. As I've noted here, there are about 100 Cray-1 systems that were actually sold, uh, quite a large number, I'd say. About this time, we were developing software. Uh, the, the, the level one blahs were coming onto the scene. Level one blahs are vector operations. We had a vector-based computer, and we had vector, uh, in, we had uh, the opportunity to express things in terms of vector operations. And that's where LIMPAC sort of emerged or came onto the scene, uh, taking linear algebra, using those blobs as the kernels with the hope of getting performance uh, on those vector architectures. The LIMPAC routines, unlike IcePAC, were designed to be column oriented and relying on the blobs for the basic operations. So we had vector machines. Uh, vector operations, column oriented, and we thought everything was uh, was good in terms of performance, and it did pretty good in terms of the performance that we uh, that we were able to see. Let's see, I'm just I'm not getting my slides. There you go. So in the 90s, um, we had another change take place in the overall architecture. The architecture changes that took place were um, processors had uh, cache and, and a, quite a lot of cache associated with them. So data would move from main memory into the cache and then from the cache, they would be used uh, by the floating point units. And we also had shared memory parallel machines coming onto the scene. There was sort of a, a, a myriad of, of, uh, of new architectures, new companies created. And I've listed some of them uh, at the bottom of the slide there, trying to uh, enter the scene, trying to uh, uh, leverage uh, that uh, architecture, cache-based systems and shared memory architectures into a computing system that would uh, be uh, helpful in addressing some of the uh, computational engineering uh, applications that people had. And uh, all of those companies were interesting. They all failed uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of being around for a long time, but they all posed a uh, interesting architecture, which we learned something from in the course of things. And then along came um, uh, the blahs. So the, the, we took the uh, level one blahs and raised the level of granularity to focus on that cache-based system that we had, and also a hope of getting some leverage with the shared memory parallel uh, processing that was there. So we developed uh, the level two and the level three blobs. When I say we developed, I really mean the community developed. So these were community efforts to put together the ideas that were popular at the time, to put together a package, to uh, integrate uh, what, was, uh, what was important in terms of uh, the linear algebra and also the operations to come up with a package that would be hopefully used 
by a wide group of people. And um, uh, in the in the 90s, uh, Jim Jim and I, Jim Demel and I, put together this uh, uh, proposal to develop LA Pack, taking the ideas and concepts uh, and algorithms from Ice Pack and Lin Pack and updating them uh, to use these ideas of uh, cache-based systems and shared memory. And again, it was a community effort. The community came together to help build that package. So it wasn't just a small group uh, at Berkeley and, and at uh, Tennessee uh, developing these things. It was a community-based effort, which had many, many hands, uh, many activities going on to uh, express the algorithms, to develop algorithms and contribute it to the package and to carry on from that. In the uh, beginning of the, the turn of the century, uh, we had uh, we had not only shared memory but distributed memory uh, systems that emerged. And again, there was a wide collection of companies that were marketing uh, distributed memory systems. Uh, again, the, there's a there's a scattering of them listed at the bottom of the uh, page. There, those companies all failed in terms of being uh, uh, sustaining themselves for a long period of time. Uh, but they uh, they gave uh, to the community the opportunity to. Um, to, um, to develop and express uh, the algorithm so that uh, it could effectively, uh, we could effectively use those par parallel systems uh, for our computations. It was about that time where we realized that we needed to have some way of doing message passing. So um, there was a small group of people here in the mountains of Tennessee that put together a system called PVM, Parallel Virtual Machine. The idea was to put together a collection of processes and have them communicate with each other, passing messages in a distributed way in order to accomplish a computation. And uh, from, from PVM and from a number of other activities around the world, uh, we developed uh, the MPI standard. And again, I say we, I mean the community. The community got together, putting together the ideas that were found in many of these, uh, these uh, message passing systems into a way which can be organized and, and we would feel that we had enough coverage that we would uh, activate them and make them available on the machines. The MPI activity was really uh, community driven. It was an incredible activity. It took only 18 months for us to define that standard. We met every, uh, we met, we met every six weeks uh, in, a, in a poor, uh, mediocre hotel outside of the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Uh, to hash out the details, about 40 people getting together to hash out the details. And at the end of that 18 months, we had something which we call the standard and which the community was ready to embrace. So when I say that, each vendor had its own way of doing message passing up to this point. And now there was a, quote, de facto standard, very much like the BLAS and its characteristics, which the vendors gravitated to almost immediately and implemented on their machines and uh, that became the standard for doing business. And with that, we were able to develop uh, ScalaPack. So ScalaPack does message passing. It relies on something which we created called the PBLAS, which was an intermediate level before going into, into the specifics of doing message passing. And uh, the PBLAS allowed us to express things at the right level of granularity, I'll say. And then uh, they, in turn, called on the lower level functions of, uh, for doing the communication. It became obvious that uh, we had parallel machines and not only obvious, these machines were getting much larger in terms of the parallelism that was expressed in the machine itself. Our algorithms uh, were able to uh, look at uh, loop level parallelism. So we had a fork join based model for doing our computations. Uh, it was basically start something sequential, fork off a number of tasks and then come together again in a join operation before you started the next uh, the next iteration. And if you're dealing with thousands, hundreds of thousands of processes, something like this is a disaster. You can't have a single point of synchronization when we're talking about that level of parallelism. So it became obvious we needed something bigger, uh, something, uh, a different mechanism uh, to express our parallelism. And, um, you know, this is an old idea. It's uh, the idea of using a directed acyclic graph to express your parallelism uncovering uh, uh, ways in which you can uh, get ahead of the operations in some sense, do things in an almost out of order fashion to allow the computation to flow much more naturally to express things and trying to break that, um, break those barriers. So um, there was, a, there was a, a, a thought of rewriting the codes uh, for that model 
We also noticed that we had uh, many opportunities to do a, a large number of the same operation over and over again. And uh, we, we thought it might be useful to have a mechanism to express that at a high level. So have one call that does the same operation on different chunks of data. So think of doing matrix multiply, but doing thousands of matrix multiplies simultaneously on independent things make it by making one call. And uh, you can think about extending that to uh, other matrix operations, factorizations, SVDs, and so on for smaller matrices. This has an important uh, implication in terms of machine learning where these kind of operations are done over and over again. And um, that found its way into this, uh, into this, uh, into the story of uh, parallel computing and linear algebra. So we developed a framework called Parsec that let us express the parallelism within the programs. After Parsec, um, uh, OpenMP had a similar mechanism for describing uh, directed acyclic graphs. And we, we wrote to that standard because it, it provided a much more uh, flexible way of doing it. Parsec is still being used for distributed uh, uh, memory operations. Uh, we developed a set of uh, batched uh, BLAS routines uh, that uh, covered uh, the, the, the BLAS and allowed us to work on these small matrices in a very uh, standard way, uh, carrying out operations that could very efficiently be uh, orchestrated on these uh, parallel machines uh, that we have today. The next architectural feature that, uh, that we bump into <clears throat> is one where we uh, have accelerators hybrid systems. So there's a processor, um, a CPU tied together with an accelerator uh, in some close uh, proximity where data is passed from the CPU over to the accelerator, offloading part of the computation to the accelerator. Presumably the accelerator can carry out that function very fast and then send the results back to the CPU. So that's the model that we have for hybrid architectures. Of course, we're not going to be satisfied with just one processor and one GPU. We think about putting together multiple uh, CPUs. Uh, we think about putting together multiple GPUs uh, on, a single, on a single node. And to take that to extreme, uh, the machine that we have uh, here at Oak Ridge National Lab called Summit uh, is based on just this uh, idea. So the Summit machine is getting a bit long in the tooth. It was put in place in 2018. It has a peak performance of 200 petaflops. It consumes about 10 megawatts of power. Power is a big deal with uh, these uh, supercomputers, uh, 10 megawatts. Um, uh, so just in terms of a rough rule of thumb, one megawatt year. If you use one megawatt at your house for one year, you'll get a bill from the electric company for about a million dollars. That's, that's, a, that's typical in the US. Other countries may be higher or lower, but that's what we see in the US. So it's about $10 million to keep that machine running, um, uh, 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 functioning. Uh, uh, of course, the machine itself costs much more, but uh, that, that's the uh, ongoing cost. So this machine is composed of two processors, IBM Power9 processors, and then six NVIDIA uh, GPUs. So that's one node of the system uh, that uh, machine has, um, a large number of nodes, but you know, they, from the standpoint of trying to use this architecture, you have to use the GPUs in order to get performance. So um, if you, 98% uh, 90, of the performance is gonna come from the GPUs. So if you're not using the GPUs, the performance is gonna be sub, uh, very, very low from the standpoint of that peak, uh, theoretical peak performance. So we have to structure the algorithms to effectively use uh, those uh, GPUs in order to extract extract performance. And that's where uh, we come into the, the, the current uh, package that we're developing that's called Slate. It's designed for distributed memory and heterogeneous architectures. It's a C++ uh, implementation of those, uh, of those algorithms. Many of the algorithms are still the same algorithms uh, from the wilkinson Reinch uh, handbook. Uh, some of them have been updated, of course. Uh, we use task-based uh, DAG scheduling. Uh, we look at tiles in order to uh, keep chunks of work small. We think about heterogeneous architectures and some way to batch uh, the, uh, the, the computations in order to, uh, to effectively uh, use them. So we're thinking about exascale with Slate. Exascale is going to have on the order of 10 to the fourth nodes 
and on the order of 10 to the seventh cores. So very massive amounts of parallelism. The machine that's going into place that's gonna replace Summit at Oak Ridge is called Frontier. And that's the characteristics for the Frontier system, which will be about two exaflops in, in nature. So we're trying to design math libraries that will, that will span this, um, this computational pyramid from laptops up to departmental servers to regional servers up to uh, the large uh, high performance machines. And uh, that software should adhere to those same, uh, those same uh, uh, eight uh, principles, accuracy, community involvement, innovation, performance, portability, productivity, readability, and uh, reliability. That's what we're striving for uh, in, these, uh, in these packages. So today's environment is highly parallel, distributed using MPI and open MP. So think of uh, message passing being done by MPI and then within the node, within the multi-core uh, framework of that node, we're gonna be using open MP, open MP as the programming uh, model. Uh, the Frontier system, as I said, has about two exaflops of theoretical peak performance, about uh, eight, eight million cores. It has uh, 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 9,000 uh, nodes associated with it. The power consumption is on the order of 30 megawatts. And again, if you don't use those GPUs, you won't realize anywhere near that kind of uh, effective um, uh, peak performance. So 98% of the performance is coming from the GPUs. If you just use the CPUs, your algorithms will uh, be, be quite uh, hindered. So heterogeneous is the model uh, that we have. And I think we're gonna be with heterogeneous for a while. So in fact, I think it's gonna be expansive. Uh, that is to say, architectures of the future will, um, will continue to have multi-core GPUs and some other accelerators that have been thrown into the mix. And those accelerators may be for doing uh, aspects of machine learning. They may be accelerators for doing uh, aspects of uh, quantum computing. They may be accelerators for doing uh, neuromorphic computing. All of those things being composed in a high performance system, not just one of them being exploited, but hopefully uh, we can exploit the most uh, important parts of that, uh, of that array of things to help us in solving our, our problems. So this idea of simple loop level parallelism is really too uh, limiting in terms of the performance we can extract. Uh, communication is, is really where the problem is in terms of getting performance on, on any of these systems. Uh, uh, today, uh, our machines have too much floating point uh, capability, I'll say. You take a look at those GPUs with all of that floating point uh, performance, and unless we can get the, the data to it, it's gonna be far from the theoretical peak. So our traditional notion of comparing things in terms of operation counts may not be really a reflection of the time to solution. So the op count is probably not the right mechanism to use here uh, because we can do more operations and it would take less time to do those operations uh, in many situations. And then we have this, uh, this other dimension of looking at multiple precisions. So today we have processors that look at 64-bit uh, floating point, 32-bit uh, floating point, 16-bit floating point, and the newest processors actually have 8-bit uh, floating point uh, capability. So the question from our standpoint is how can we effectively exploit that kind of hardware uh, to, um, uh, to drive our applications? So let me just go back and look at that um, uh, IBM 37195. And if I take a look at the ice pack code that we have for computing the symmetric eigenvalue problem, um, and I run it on the IBM uh, 37195, I, I have recorded the uh, performance for that uh, problem. And then I run it on a, a modern um, uh, processor, an Intel Sandy Bridge, which is pretty old by this time, but Sandy Bridge, one core of that Sandy Bridge, that's all that ice pack can really use. That's all the compiler really allows IcePack to use in this context. Uh, what we see is um, a speed up. So the same, the same software from IcePack running on the uh, Argon machine back in 1970 and running on one core of the Sandy Bridge, we see an increase in performance of, of 400. So that's the speed up that we obtain, uh, not from the software, but just from the hardware standpoint, just by using, just by compiling and running it. On that, uh, on that machine, we would see a speed up of uh, 400 
uh, times in the 40 years since then. If we take into account some of the uh, algorithmic improvements that have been made since IcePack, so replacing some of the things using a divide and conquer algorithm uh, for computing those eigenvalues and running that on that, um, on that system, uh, exploiting some of the parallelism that's available on that, um, on that uh, 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 Sandy Bridge processor, we end up with uh, getting a um, uh, performance increase over the IBM uh, 195, about 85,000 times speed up. Uh, over that. So that's, that's, that's hardware that's been changed, but also the algorithm has been changed uh, to, to drive it towards using or effectively using that parallel processing. And then if we, uh, if we go a step further and use distributed computing with that and looking at um, a, a larger machine, uh, we, can, we can extract even, even greater performance. So, um, so changes take place in the hardware, um, changes take place in the software and the algorithms that allow us to exploit things in a much better way. So there are some critical issues uh, that we have to face in designing the software. Communication reducing algorithms is one of them. Here's a, here's a graphic that uh, Mark uh, Gates put together from, from uh, Tennessee, and it, it relates um, uh, floating point operations and data movement. So on the x-axis, we have time that's elapsing. And on the y-axis, we have the ratio of flops per data that can be moved. So these are 64-bit flops and 64-bit words that are be able to move. From our standpoint, the best situation is to have that ratio be one, one flop per data movement. So we're talking about moving data from memory, primary memory, into the place where the operation is actually going to be performed. So there, there have been machines that have that, that ratio of one, one floating point operation to one data movement uh, uh, structure. And those machines were uh, old machines. So they took place, uh, the IBM, sorry, the uh, Cray YMP was a machine that had those characteristics. The VAX, uh, uh, VAX 11 series had that characteristic, um, primarily because floating point was so slow on the, on the VAX. And as we progressed, as we move forward in time with different architectures, we sort of creep up on that, uh, on that so that, that we don't have that ratio of, of one. Uh, we get more floating point operations can be performed per words that can be transferred from memory. So in this context here, uh, we're losing performance because of uh, moving uh, data. We can't sustain the floating point operations that are capable uh, because we can't get the data to them. And as we progress over time, we see that, uh, that thing rising. So the modern processors today, the accelerators that we have today, they are, they're capable of doing uh, not uh, scalar operations, not vector operations, uh, they actually do matrix operations. So the accelerators that we have from NVIDIA and AMD and soon uh, from Intel uh, will do matrix operations in the hardware of, of, uh, of the processor itself, of the accelerator itself. And um, they're over provisioned. So they're really stretching to capture that floating point potential that they have um, by uh, because of the, the 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 lack of moving data through the system, and again, everything represented on this graph is for 60 bit, 64 bit operations, 64 bit floating point, and 64 bit words being transferred. If we change it to uh, look at other things, of course, things things change even a more dramatic fashion. Uh, floating point uh, for uh, 16 bit, uh, 8 bit is is much more. Uh, much more uh, prevalent, or, or it doesn't cost as much. Okay, I just want to I just want to take a, a, a chapter uh, out of my laptop here. So if I just look at my laptop, the the laptop I'm using to give this talk, it's a <clears throat> it's a Haswell processor. It has um, it has some uh, cache associated with it. It has some memory, and there's a CPU, and the CPU has a cycle time of 2.3 gigahertz. And that's the nominal cycle time. So there's conditions under which that cycle time can be boosted to 3.5. And that, that uh, boost uh, takes place if the, if the conditions are right in the processor. So things are not heating up too much, it'll, 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 boost, the per, it'll boost the cycle time by 50% to make things run even faster. So that Haswell processor for doing 64-bit uh, uh, operations, it can actually complete 16 each core can complete 16 floating point operations every cycle. This is a, this is a, this is a staggering amount of computation 
that's performed every cycle of that machine. So every cycle of the machine, 16 floating point operations can finish as in multiplies. Uh, and uh, that gives rise to a performance level if we go to the turbo boost mode of 56 gigaflops per core of my laptop. So that, that's a stunning achievement, I would say, for a machine I, I primarily use for reading email and giving talks, re reaching that kind of performance level. So, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so looking at this, we have uh, the floating point uh, 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 per word that comes down to 31. So uh, looking at the data transfer and looking at the floating point operation potential, uh, remember I said the, the best uh, situation would be to have a ratio of one. Here we have a ratio of 31. So I can do 31 flops for every word I can transfer uh, from memory effectively. That, that, that's, what that's, where, that's what that's saying. So my laptop on this, uh, this chart uh, would appear in the pink area, uh, not the highest point, uh, but really having an excess of uh, floating point of uh, potential. And if I take that to the implementation level, now I'm gonna run an experiment on my laptop and the experiment is gonna be using uh, the BLAS. And I'm gonna be using the best BLAS that I possibly can for this experiment. I'm gonna use one core of my, uh, of my, um, of my laptop's processing capability. So for, if I look at a DAXP, DAXP takes two vectors from memory, streams it through into the functional unit, does a computation and moves the data back out into memory. And if I do that, the best performance I can get on my uh, single core that has a peak of 56 gigaflops is 1.6 gigaflops. So again, data movement is killing the performance here of this, uh, of this operation. If I go to a matrix vector operation, so now I've raised the granularity. So I have uh, two n squared floating point operations and n squared pieces of data I'm gonna be moving. So the ratio of floating point to memory transfer is two to one. And in this case, it does run faster. Uh, 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 a matrix vector multiply runs uh, at 3.4 gigaflops. So something that's on the order of two times faster than the, the rate I was achieving for that Daxby operation. Uh, but again, I'm being hampered because I'm, I'm stuck moving, uh, moving a lot of data and I don't have enough floating point to do when the data gets to the place uh, where I can do the operations. And finally, uh, looking at matrix multiply, I finally realized things clo very close to the theoretical peak on my machine. So I'm, I'm achieving something on the order of uh, 54 gigaflops if I do that matrix multiply. And matrix multiply, uh, you know, I do two n cubed floating point operations and three n squared uh, data transfers. So I have that surface to volume uh, effect going on where we have two n uh, floating point operations for every three uh, 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 words that I transfer and I can hopefully extract, uh, extract the performance. So, um, you know, we have to be careful about uh, the analysis that we do. Uh, processors are over provisioned for floating point. Data movement's extremely expensive. The operation count really doesn't do a good job of telling us uh, the time it's going to take to solve the problem. And uh, algorithms that do more operations may actually take uh, less time. So I think that's a, a message that, that needs to be uh, uh, looked at. So I wanna talk about algorithms which are what I classify as responsibly reckless. Uh, so these are algorithms that try to be as fast as possible, perhaps even un using an unstable algorithm that might fail, but rarely fail. And we wanna be able to check for that instability. So that's the responsible part of this uh, story. And uh, if, if in fact it, we do end up with an answer that's unacceptable, we need to uh, abort and go back and use a more stable uh, algorithm. So that's the idea with uh, responsibly reckless. Uh, it's um, it's uh, 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 verify, uh, verify that we have the right, uh, the right answer. And uh, we're gonna be looking at uh, doing a simple problem, looking at solving systems of linear equations, looking at Gaussian elimination. And one of the problems with Gaussian elimination is we have to do this search, and then we have to go through a process of moving data in order to uh, stabilize the process. So we search down a column looking for the largest element, interchange it with the pivot, uh, the pivot row, and then uh, carry out, the, uh, carry out the, um, uh, the, the rank one update or the sure complement uh, uh, rank K update for the, uh, uh, for the resulting uh, problem. 
but that pivoting adds the overhead of doing the testing and also the data movement. And that's gonna be significant in terms of the heterogeneous architectures that we have. So we wanna see if we can moderate that in some way, looking to um, uh, avoid uh, doing that uh, test and data movement. So an algorithm that we're gonna look at is one that um, was um, championed by Parker. He has something called the random uh, butterfly transformation uh, for linear algebra. And the idea here is to apply a transformation to the matrix, uh, simple transformation that basically scrambles up the, the data in the matrix, scrambles it up so that um, uh, we, we're not gonna be exposed to um, uh, uh, large or small elements uh, in the matrix and we can avoid doing the pivoting and then undo that transformation uh, and carry out, uh, when, when, we, when we arrive at a solution, undo the transformation and recover, recover things uh, from the original problem. So the transformation is, is quite simple. It's a butterfly transformation. It's basically diagonals as expressed by this matrix B here um, of random elements in the matrix, which are applied to the, um, uh, to the matrix A that we have both on the left and the right. Um, and we can think about uh, not just applying one of those, but perhaps applying them a number of times, doing it recursively as shown down here at the bottom of that slide and looking at the, the results that we have. So here's some performance data. Um, uh, we've implemented this algorithm. It's probably going to appear in uh, Slate. And um, I, what I'm showing you here is based on uh, looking at um, uh, eight nodes of Summit, just using the, just using the CPUs, just using the, uh, the, the multi-core features, not the, not, the, not the GPUs yet. So we see the performance for LU with no pivoting. We see the LU with pivoting. So that's the gap there that we see uh, in terms of performance. And then I've listed their QR. So the QR here has been the time. I, I wanna get everything to be roughly uh, time oriented. So what we're looking at here, the ratios are the ratios of time to solution. So we're solving a problem using orthogonal transformations with QR, using the uh, elementary uh, transformations with LU, one no pivoting, one with pivoting. And I've divided the times by all of them by two thirds n cubed uh, to reflect the time it takes to solve the problem. So it's not surprising QR uh, got twice as many operations. So it's performing half as well as, as the other ones in that context. And now I wanna show you the butterfly algorithm. So this is what the butterfly algorithm does in this context. So we apply the butterfly algorithm. We actually do one iteration of iterative refinement. And um, if, it, uh, if it fails getting the uh, correct accuracy, the way the algorithm is designed, it, it aborts the computation and then goes back to using uh, the LU with partial pivoting. So that's the fail safe uh, mechanism I'll say within the software is to do that kind of thing. And uh, we could look at, now I'm stuck. I hate it when this happens. All right, I'm gonna, uh, that's the butterfly algorithm. And then we implemented uh, communication avoiding uh, LU. This is the tournament pivoting uh, for that uh, single, uh, sorry, for that um, uh, core, multi-core system that we have. And um, you can see the performance that we see for the uh, communication avoiding algorithm. So this is an early implementation of the communication avoiding algorithm. Uh, we may be able to enhance the performance, but I did wanna show that performance as well. And if we go and take that same implementation and do it now on GPUs, so using accelerators, uh, what we see here is that uh, this is the LU with no pivoting. Uh, this is the LU with pivoting way down here. Again, the performance hit is dramatic because of the uh, pivoting that goes on in the algorithm. And the butterfly transformation avoids that uh, by just applying these, uh, these uh, very simple transformations to the matrix to avoid, avoid, that, uh, avoid that pivoting. And the communication avoiding algorithm is, is resulting down here. So this is a uh, recklessly uh, responsible algorithm in the sense that it uh, has a chance of being giving the wrong results, uh, but we are going to proceed with it uh, anyway. Okay, so this is uh, trying to give you a sense that it, it does in fact work. Um, this is looking at um, uh, two algorithms. The, the y-axis is showing us the backward error for doing uh, a bunch of problems uh, with the random uh, butterfly transformation. And uh, the x-axis is looking at that same backward error 
with Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. So Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting for the matrices we've tested, um, and we're looking at the, the test suite from LA Pack and Scala Pack and a bunch of other matrices that we've uh, put together from other packages, uh, gives uh, both both of them give what I would call respectable numbers here. This this uh, outlier here is uh, the failure of Gauss elimination with partial pivoting on this. Um, on this uh, matrix. I want to call this the Wilkinson matrix. I remember Jim scribbling it on a board and explaining why it, it, it caused LU with partial pivoting to fail. Um, in MATLAB, it's called the uh, GFPP function. So if you if you go in and to MATLAB and, and say GFPP of, uh, of uh, eight, you'll get this matrix here. And it's the matrix which shows uh, exponential growth uh, when doing uh, partial pivoting. So LU with partial pivoting fails for that. The random, a randomized uh, algorithm is able to um, um, uh, overcome that uh, problem and, and give us a respectable solution. So the next thing I wanna talk about is communication reducing uh, algorithms and trying to break that fork join model. And that's where Slate comes in. So think of Slate as a replacement <coughs> for uh, LAPAC, and scale pack. That's its design point. It's being uh, done for the uh, DOE exascale computing program uh, that's going on. The DOE exascale computing program is um, a massive program. $3.6 billion is being spent over a seven year period to deploy hardware applications and software. So there's three machines that are being stood up. One is at Oak Ridge, one is at Livermore, and one is at Argonne. Those machines have a price tag of $600 million each. And then there's, um, so that's 1.8 billion uh, in hardware that's being developed. There's also about 1.8 billion that's being devoted to applications and software. So one of the software projects that we are involved in is to develop Slate for those exascale machines. So the target here is to, uh, is to deploy that software so it effectively runs on those machines. So it's being written in M it rewritten in C++, it uses MPI, it uses OpenMP tasks. It's a replacement for uh, ScalaPack and hopefully uh, can, uh, can do that in a very effective way. So the software stack for Slate is listed up here on the top right. Uh, it's designed to work with uh, this collection of, uh, of today's uh, accelerators. It's intended to effectively exploit what the vendors provide for their uh, for their architectures in terms of um, uh, basic uh, operations. And if we look at the coverage that Slate will have compared to uh, Scalapack, it's pretty much complete coverage with um, new things being added to the uh, package and uh, a number of things being left out. One of the, one of the, um, uh, the failures I'll say from Scalapack is we didn't have a non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. Uh, there's only components which have to be put together that may give you the right solution, give you the solution you're looking for. And um, with Slate, uh, we'll, probably, uh, we'll probably take on that challenge after we finish with uh, the, the bulk of the work that we're doing here. So Slate um, is going to be enabled so that it will effectively use the hardware that's available <clears throat> on the machine, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the multi-core and also the uh, accelerators. Uh, that are that are there. So the uh, the basic design of um, Slate is going to be around a data flow uh, a based approach, uh, trying to exploit uh, a directed acyclic graph representation, trying to um, overlap as much as possible, trying to <clears throat> break that fork join parallelism, and trying to reduce the overall time uh, to solution. And just to give you a cartoon version, you know, the LA pack routine is based on a panel. So this is a Cholesky factorization. This is a right looking uh, version of that. Uh, we're, we're, we're basically in, in this phase here. We want to uh, uh, effectively uh, compute this panel here. We do a Cholesky factorization of the triangular block. We apply things to a column and then uh, do a rank K update for the, for the trailing part of the matrix there to complete uh, the application of that transformation. With Slate, we think about tiling the algorithm. Uh, so we break things up into tiles, and those tiles get reflected into uh, components, which then uh, would be run uh, on, on the machine itself. 
And if we take a look at the, the directed acyclic graph for a very small problem, uh, this is for using four cores and looking at where the synchronization points are. Uh, if we just wrote things in terms of a, a loop level parallelism, it would look something like this. And uh, because we're, we're reorganizing things using a directed acyclic graph, things, things go out of the natural order of those loops and allowing us to shorten the, the path uh, for that DAG. This is a small problem. For larger problems, that, uh, that length gets compressed even, even further, uh, reducing the time to solution. There's a critical path, of course, which must be respected <clears throat> within the uh, directed acyclic graph uh, to give us the correct results. So the next critical um, issue and challenge is uh, trying to exploit uh, mixed precision. So <clears throat> we want to exploit mixed precision because it does less communication. It reduces the memory traffic. It uh, reduces the, the, the overall uh, uh, footprint. It allows us to do uh, use the faster arithmetic that we have on our machines. And we're looking for numerical properties that let us exploit that um, reduce precision and then uh, hopefully recover the full accuracy uh, that we uh, that we have. This is um, this is trying to indicate if I go to 60, uh, if I go to um, uh, 32 bit half precision or sorry a single precision. There's a factor of two on this version of the of the uh, Nvidia processor. If I go to 16 bit uh, floating point arithmetic, I can get down uh, 16 times improvement over what I get on the, um, on the uh, uh, double precision version. IEEE gives us a, um, a path for doing quad, double, single, and half precision. And this is what we have from uh, IEEE. Uh, half precision is the one that uh, is, the, is the one that we're interested in. And the problem here is the dynamic range of numbers is quite small because we only have five bits here to work with in the exponent. So that limits us the largest, uh, exponent we can have is uh, 65,000. So if things get larger than that, um, uh, we, we effectively uh, overflow on the machine. And um, we're seeing more and more uh, vendors describing their own arithmetic. So Google has something called Bfloat. Bfloat says they really can't get by with just those five bits that IEEE talked about. They're going to change it to be eight bits of exponent. So um, uh, Google wants uh, Google in its uh, in its implementation of 16-bit arithmetic has eight bits for the exponent, with a trade-off only having uh, seven bits for the mantissa. So uh, Google tries to address that, giving us a larger dynamic dynamic range. Nvidia says, "Look, we're going to uh, have a, have basically give you best of both worlds." We're going we're gonna to have a representation of floating point numbers, which have eight bits of exponent and 10 bits of mantissa. So in NVIDIA's uh, TF32, which is a, uh, with, uh, it's not a data format. It's not a way in which you store numbers. It's a way in which numbers are represented internally when they do the floating point operations. So it gives you the ability to do, uh, to do things with uh, a bigger exponent range and a wider fraction than you could uh, on, say, the, uh, the Google system. But what we're seeing is more and more um, vendors, cloud vendors, developing their own hardware, developing their own processors. So this is either a good thing or a scary thing. Um, so Google has its uh, TPUs, its accelerator for doing machine learning. It's, uh, it's similar to a GPU, only it works on their, their machine learning kinds of applications. Amazon has something called a Graviton, which does the same kind of thing. Apple, of course, has its M1 processor, which is an ARM-based uh, processor. But the vendors are, these vendors are not buying into Intel, AMD, or the traditional uh, processors. They say, we can do it ourselves and do it better and probably cheaper than we can if we purchased it from, uh, from Intel. Um, NVIDIA recently came up with its newer processor called Hopper. Hopper has an interesting uh, feature. It does 8-bit floating point arithmetic. So it does matrix multiplies, 8 bits of floating point uh, precision. And the way things are organized, you have two options. One is to have 5 bits for the exponent, and the other is to have um, uh, 4 bits for the exponent. So the Mantissa here uh, with this version only has two, two uh, bits of accuracy 
And for the other version, it has three bits, but they feel certain machine learning applications can in fact uh, get by and use that quite, uh, quite effectively. Machine learning is a big deal. Okay, I don't think I need to tell anybody here about it. Um, uh, it's linear algebra all the way down. They can get by with 16 bit floating point operations. You know, there are many companies that are now emerging that have hardware specifically for uh, machine learning uh, uh, at various stages, in fact, uh, of that uh, process. So that, that's a big deal. And uh, we wanna, I, I would say from our standpoint, our community should be looking at ways to exploit that, um, uh, that lower precision, uh, trying to develop algorithms that can effectively use uh, mixed precision to carry on its uh, function. So by using mathematical techniques, uh, it gives us the ability to transfer less data uh, to the hardware where the operations are done. So if we transfer less data, do the operations even at a higher precision and then truncate it and transfer it back, uh, we still may be getting uh, uh, some benefit from doing it that way or using some combination of those two things, the mathematical technique and then uh, doing the truncation, uh, but uh, exploiting the hardware uh, for the, uh, for the uh, computation itself. Okay, so we've, uh, we've had these ideas for a while uh, using mixed precision. Uh, the idea goes something like this, exploit the lower precision as much as possible, uh, correct the solution, and then uh, refine the results uh, if you can, uh, to get a more accurate uh, solution basis. So compute in 32, correct that 32 results in higher precision, 64-bit, and then uh, see, in fact, if we, can, uh, if we can iterate and make that better. So we've looked at this back in 2004. There was a processor called a IBM cell processor. It was the basis of the uh, Los Alamos Roadrunner system. It was also the basis of the game, the game processor that I had connected to my TV, a Sony PlayStation 3. So both used the same processor. And it had this uh, rather interesting uh, feature where 32-bit arithmetic uh, was 14 times faster than double precision. So single precision was at 200 gigaflops, double precision was at 14 gigaflops. And if you could exploit that single precision somehow through a mixed precision algorithm, you might be able to gain some of the performance that we see there. So that was the result of a poor design of the 64-bit uh, uh, arithmetic processing capability. Uh, things were not pipelined. They were done, uh, they, they were done serially, and that resulted in that uh, large, uh, large difference between the single and double, but that, that's what we had to work with. So the idea was to use iterative refinement. So this goes back to that uh, early work uh, using iterative refinement, uh, factor the matrix using 32-bit arithmetic, a computer residual with the original data in 64-bit arithmetic, and then go through a process of uh, computing a correction in 32-bit arithmetic, adding that 32-bit arithmetic correction to the approximate solution, and then a computer residual in higher precision, and then iterate on that. And the results were rather striking. So this is the results on that cell processor. So doing the computation in double precision is uh, listed down here. This is the double precision result. This is the single precision result. And then using the mixed precision allows one to get this eight times speed up and have the same accuracy as the double precision result. There are of course caveats to this. Uh, the machine has to be reasonably well conditioned in order for this process to work. You need at least one digit of accuracy in the single precision uh, for this to be correct. Uh, to, to, to come to, uh, to, to converge the iteration. And you need a copy of the matrix in double precision and in single precision in order to do this. So that was the standard algorithm that uh, we, we, uh, we talked about. Um, uh, Nick, Nick uh, Hyam and Aaron Carson showed you can solve the innermost problem not by using LUD composition, but by using an iterative method. So they use GM res as, uh, as the method to solve that correction. And they use the they use a, the preconditioner, the LU factors uh, from the original factorization in in uh, the lower precision uh, to help with uh, GM res converging. And using that approach, um, it converges quite rapidly. Uh, there's a lot of nice uh, properties that result. You don't contaminate that correction with any of the conditioning uh, from the original problem. 
uh, you're solving it through that iterative method and uh, things work out quite nicely. Their paper is much more elegant than I've described it here. It talks about actually using three different precisions in the process and looking at the benefits of those uh, three different precisions. But this is what we see in practice for that algorithm, uh, the, uh, the Hyam Carson algorithm. Uh, this, is, um, this is looking at double precision. So this is uh, running on, um, uh, this is running on a, a graphics processor. Uh, uh, looking at the performance we get, that's double precision. If we go to single precision uh, with the factorization and then use iterative refinement to get to the same answer we got with the double precision, uh, we see that factor of uh, close to two uh, using 16-bit arithmetic. If the matrix is well enough conditioned, you can get better uh, accuracy. And then using their matrix tensor core uh, uh, functions on the accelerator, uh, we can even get to higher higher precision. And in this case, we get to four times uh, the performance uh, that we saw using double precision, the same accuracy. And uh, the numbers here represent the number of iterations that were necessary uh, for the uh, process to converge. Again, these are well-conditioned problems. Your, your, your mileage may vary depending on the conditioning of your problem. Okay, um, the last thing I wanna talk about here in my remaining minutes is uh, what we're doing today. This is, uh, this is part of the ballistic project. This is an NSF funded effort to uh, update and extend LAPAC. It's uh, sort of overhauling a lot of what's in LAPAC, uh, but also adding um, randomized algorithms uh, to, the, to the package. So randomized algorithms you know, have this great ability to help us in getting uh, approximations uh, to the solution. Uh, by sketching and then and then doing the refinement. So uh, LAPAC is going to, uh, sorry, Ballistic will include some randomized algorithms uh, in it. We're working on a, um, uh, a, a templates-like uh, document which describes uh, this in detail. Michael Mahoney, Jim Demmel, Julian Langu, uh, people at Tennessee and at uh, Berkeley are involved in this process. We're putting together MATLAB and Python versions of the code. There'll be a C++ implementation at some point uh, to, uh, to drive this forward. Okay, so concluding here, um, the software always follows the hardware. And uh, you know, the, way I, the way I view it is the hardware guys throw something over the fence and uh, the software guys scramble and the applications people scramble to figure out how to effectively use that hardware. So every decade or so, the software needs to be updated and adapted uh, to the hardware architectures that we have. Uh, we should be experimenting with mixed precision to see what we can leverage uh, from the AI community. Uh, that hardware is gonna be around, I feel, for a long time. And we should be looking at what we can use, how we can use that effectively in solving some of our problems. We should keep in mind that um, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom of comparing things in terms of operation count really doesn't reflect the time to solution, given the fact that floating point operations are really over provisioned on these uh, machines and data movement is really the, the key thing. We should think about uh, recklessly responsible algorithms, take shortcuts that can be verified. And uh, if they work, uh, go with it. If they can't work, go to a fallback position where we, uh, we engage in the original uh, algorithm. And you know, it's about um, the way I view software. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It takes a long time to develop this stuff. And not only does it take a long time, but it has to evolve over, over time. And the important things that go into those packages uh, should be accuracy, getting the community involved, having state-of-the-art stuff, looking at performance, portability, productivity of the end user, looking to make sure the code is readable and also uh, effectively uh, reliable. Um, so with that, I'll just say uh, thanks um, to uh, a number of people who have contributed. Uh, I certainly can't uh, do justice uh, uh, by giving them credit, but uh, I'll try to by presenting uh, this slide. So let me uh, stop there and see if I've offended anybody. Thank you so much, Jack, for a great perspective, historical, current and future. So I will try to see whether I can have people. So for those who have questions, you should be able to unmute yourself now. So Katrin, can you, you should be able, you have a question. Can you, can you unmute yourself? Uh, I think so. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I will. I will just read my question then. So uh, first, yeah. Thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, I really like this notion of recklessly responsible for like balancing speed and stability. But as somebody who has worked a bit in stability analysis, I often feel like the rigorous analysis is so far behind all of the variants that people are coming up with these days. And I just wonder, like, how do we balance this tension um, with, you know, trying out all kinds of new things and they're faster, but then if you have to fall back on a stable algorithm, it may be that the only stable algorithm known is like communication bound and it's too expensive to use. So how do you, how do you think we can deal with that going forward? Well, okay, so, um, you know, we're, the, way, the way we're dealing with it in our algorithms is, is to engage in the re recklessly responsible approach. Uh, if it fails, um, basically abort that computation, throw it away, and restart the whole problem again with the with the problem uh, with the old problem with the old way of doing it, which is going to be a lot slower. So, so we take a performance hit in that case where we uh, where we have a failure, and the overall goal is or the hope is that we won't have that many failures. That is, we will in fact. Uh, be able to, in many cases, uh, use the um, use the get the benefits of the recklessly responsible approach, and uh, very seldom have to go to uh, very seldom have to go to the um, uh, to, to the traditional way of doing it. Now we better have a good way to make sure that um, uh, the, re the the reckless approach is is giving us the right solution. Uh, we need a check to make sure that what we're computing is something that's that's valid and, and makes sense. Uh, um, uh, if we don't have that, then I don't think we can engage in in that that the, the approach I've described. Are there more questions? You should be able to unmute yourselves. Uh, I have a question. This is Dan Bowling. Really enjoyed the talk, and congratulations on your award. I was wondering, is there a there used to be at one time interest in looking at hard, transient hardware in the arithmetic and designing algorithms that would sort of do some self-correcting with some version of correcting codes or that could be incorporated into the matrix algorithms. Uh, I don't know, is that still an issue? Yeah, I thought it would be, um, but the sky isn't falling. Um, so. Uh, you know, we've we've worked with uh, the big machines, and uh, you know, we, we've engaged in projects to uh, look at uh, fault tolerance um, uh, of uh, processors failing or processors giving us the wrong results, and being able to back up and go to a point where maybe we have a checkpoint in doing it. So um, today, um, uh, the way the applications uh, uh, approach this, uh, all, all the machines today have um, non-volatile memory. So don't forget about disks. There's no disks involved. Uh, they have non-volatile memory, so they can easily take a checkpoint uh, to that um, non-volatile memory. And if they do have a process failure, uh, they, they basically restart from that uh, checkpoint, which is quite fast, um, uh, and carry on the computation. Um, now, if a process gives you the wrong results and doesn't detect that it's giving you the result, wrong results, then things just progress, and um, you know, you're going to get the wrong answer, maybe. Um, and then, of course, that's a frightening, uh, that's a frightening thought, uh, but, uh, you know, can we, uh, can we, uh, uh, does that happen a lot? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know if we get the, the wrong answer. You know, I can give you anecdotal cases where when a new machine is installed, you know, something happens and the processors are giving you the wrong results. And sometimes that's detected by the manufacturer's uh, checks. Sometimes it's detected by users. Um, you know, and, and other times it may be undetected altogether. You know, there's been stories about Intel coming up with the divide problem. Cleve knows about this quite, quite uh, well. He was one that exposed it. You know, when, when the first Cray-1 was being installed in Los Alamos, I detected an error in the arithmetic unit um, that was going undetected for, uh, I don't know how long. And it was only by, you know, running something where I had a good, a good check going on uh, to see what the results should be where it was, it was able to detect that it, that it was failing in that particular case. But I would say um, it doesn't, it's not something, uh, uh, so a lot of the effort uh, with, uh, with doing things in terms of checkpoint restart, um, I would say a lot of those ideas have not been uh, pushed forward onto these new machines. 
the kinds of things that go on at the algorithm level. Uh, so people are looking at doing the checkpoint and restart by using the non-volatile memory and coming up with ways to compress the data so that uh, it comes uh, uh, to and from that non-volatile memory uh, with, um, with, uh, with greater speed. Um, so considering the time, we should probably stop the recording here. Bart, can you do this? And um, officially close this.